Uh, welcome to Montana Tech's public lecture series. Um, today we're honored to have with us uh, Grace Voltail. Grace is a PhD student at Cornell. Um, she got her undergraduate degree from Stanford in 2006. Four. Right? 2004. No, 2004. <laughs> you were 96. 2004. Her, she got a master's degree from Montana Tech probably around 2006. That's when I started. When you yeah. started? Okay. Uh, as a Sloan Scholar um, in the Project Engineering Management um, master's program. And she got her MS from Columbia in a field very close to what she's in now, the water yeah. field, um, just a couple of years ago, I think, yeah. right? And she's, she's uh, working on hopefully finishing up her PhD at Cornell um, as we speak. But she was, uh, she, she is Crow, grew up outside of Billings, always outside of Billings, and we're just, uh, she comes back to Montana every so often with her AHEM meetings and, and other things, but we're just delighted that she could be here with us today, meeting with the students and wandering around and seeing things, and then with the Sloan group from Montana. So the floor is yours, Grace, to talk about managing water resources and water quality, and this includes also a travel perspective. Thank you. So, thank you, Bev. Um, so I'm in the um, I'm in the Department of Biological and Environmental Engineering at Cornell University, and um, within the department, I'm in the Soil and Water Lab. Um, and a lot of the work that we do, um, my advisor in particular, he does um, eco hydrology studies, um, and anything ranging from water resource management um, to nutrient cycling. Um, a lot of my colleagues do work in that area, um, but it's primarily um, field-based. And Cornell is one of, it's unique in that it's um, an Ivy League school and it's also, some of the colleges are land grant. Um, so it's, it's good to have that, that mix. Um, the um, Biological and Environmental Engineering Department is in the College of Agriculture and Life Science. Um, so we do a lot of um, extension work and a lot of outreach work. And my, um, my own advisor, um, Dr. Todd Walter, is a, um, he's the director of the New York State Water Resource Institute. Um, so he does work with um, work with water resources um, throughout the state of New York. And um, he's, he's really been instrumental in um, helping me think through my, um, my dissertation work and um, so far has been um, supportive of all of, the, all of the aspects that I want to touch on. Um, so in talking about um, water resources, um, particularly in tribal communities, it's important to always give, um, to give um, some background and some history um, because that's very closely, the water is very closely tied to um, the history of the land and um, the natural resources. So, I hope this works. <laughs> Okay. It's moving on here. <laughs> well, I don't know how to do this. That's, I guess that's a problem we had before. Um, oh. What? Do I have to? Does that work? Nope. It doesn't work. It, it would work if you're doing it from the. Oh, there you go. Okay. I'll just Probably. do it from there. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> um, so in my work, um, I've looked mostly at communities um, in Montana, North Dakota, um, the, uh, the arid west, um, as I refer to it, um, especially when speaking to people from 
out on the East Coast where um, the precipitation patterns are a lot different. Um, so this is, I like to include this graphic. It's, um, there's uh, where Montana would be today. Um, the Powder River Basin was um, Crow territory and then the neighboring tribes throughout. And I think the borders are pretty much um, outlined by the river systems. So that's, um, this was the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851. Um, so some of my, some of my initial work was um, with the Crow tribe. Um, as Beverly had mentioned, I'm a member in, I'm also a descendant of the three affiliated tribes from North Dakota, so the Mandan, Hidatsa, Rikara, and I did some initial, um, some initial work there for my doctorate. Um, but I include this um, just to outline the historical events um, for the state of Montana. So, I mean, things starting with the Fort Laramie Treaty, um, Montana becoming a state, and some of the key, um, some of the key water resource legislation. So, the Winters Doctrine. Um, it's um, kind of essential to include all of the legal aspects when speaking about water um, in tribal communities. Um, so this is the territories that were outlined in various <laughs> treaties um, and then compared that from the Powder River Basin that was outlined and then um, the land base today. So I, like, I wanted to um, focus on in telling um, this history of the area, um, particularly with Crow resources, um, I wanted to focus on um, some historical figures that were that were key in defining um, the water the water rights, and um, also that were key in setting up the initial tribal governments. Um, so this I like to include this picture. It's um, the 1880 delegation to DC, and there are several of the um, of the Crow chiefs, um, Medicine Crow, and Chief Plenty Coos, um, among them. And then the um, the other gentlemen in the background are the um, they were the agents for for the um, BIA or the Department of Interior. So they essentially would accompany the, um, the chiefs and be the interpret interpreters. Um, so I mentioned Chief Plenty Coos. Um, he, was, he was the last um, chief of the Crow tribe and he was also essential in, um, in a lot of the key um, of the key legislation, particularly when the reservation was formed um, throughout the early 1900s. And he eventually, um, he donated his home in Pryor, which is um, just right across from these, these mountains, um, to the state of Montana as a, um, as a sign of goodwill to, to the state of Montana in, um, in forming a partnership. And the next, um, the next figure I like to include is um, Robert Yellowtail. So his background is he, um, he attended um, the BIA boarding schools and he was sent to um, a school um, on the reservation at a very young age. So he was around, um, I've heard it was, he was around four years old when he was sent off to boarding school. Um, and he eventually graduated from the school and then went on to, um, went on to school at um, the Sherman Institute in Riverside, California. And he did some initial um, correspondence courses and he was interested in studying law and he studied um, law through the University of Chicago. Um, so I include this picture, it's a really old, um, 
of the mission style campus that um, you would see at the Sherman Institute. The school is still there today. Um, and it almost reminds me of um, my alma mater, <laughs> the same um, mission style building there. Um, but I'm sure it was a very different environment um, when he attended there um, at the turn of the century. So he, um, he was one of the first educated um, Crow people to return to, um, to return back home and to help with the, um, I mean, all of the legal issues that they were dealing with at the time. Um, he worked closely with um, Chief Plenikus and he served as um, an interpreter when the, when the tribal delegations would go to, um, to DC. Um, and that was, that was really essential because a lot of the chiefs um, did not speak English. So it was, it was really essential to have someone that could speak English and also speak to um, the Crow people that were making the, the decisions and also to be informed um, on the legal issues. Um, uh, so some of the other work that he did um, was to advocate for um, voting rights for Indians and also to, um, for Indians to become citizens, to um, gain their citizenship um, as Americans um, in the 1920s. And he went on to become um, superintendent and also chairman of the Crow tribe. So the Yellowtail Dam, um, it's, it was constructed um, as part of the part of the series of dams um, that were that were built throughout Indian Country um, in the 1940s and 1950s, and that was part of the um, the Pick Sloan program. So that was a joint effort between the um, the Army Corps of Engineers and the Bureau of Reclamation, so two, um, two federal entities. <coughs> and they pretty much um, condemned lands um, throughout, throughout Indian territories, um, often flooded communities. Uh, so when the Old Tail Dam was built, that was, um, that was built in Bighorn Canyon, which at the time was a very low flow stream. Um, and then now today it's, um, it's the Bighorn Reservoir, Bighorn Lake. Um, so Yellowtail was particularly, um, he was involved with the building of, or <laughs> not the building of the dam, but um, the opposition to build the dam. Um, what he wanted to do was he wanted to lease the dam site um, very much like the um, Salish Kootenai tribes um, had done to um, to have the dam built and then lease lease the site for 50 years and eventually um, own the site or continue to lease it. Um, but that um, that didn't happen, and the tribe was eventually compensated for this site, and the site was taken um, by eminent domain. And the Crow tribe eventually had to um, had to receive payment for the dam site. So they received that payment um, after the construction had begun in 1963. Um, so this is a large part of the uh, the historical background of the Bighorn River um, and the water resources in the area. So this leads to um, present day with the Claims Resolution Act. So the um, Crow tribes, along with several other tribes, um, finally had reached um, water settlements with the federal government. And they, um, they received compensation for things like um, having, their, having their lands flooded, their um, lands taken and prevented um, in having the um, water resources um, 
managed by the federal government for all those years. So the Crow tribe in particular, they were um, given an allocation from the Bighorn River, the Bighorn Reservoir, um, and some storage that is remaining in the Bighorn Reservoir. Um, and those were, those were all attached to a priority date of 1961 when the, um, when the reservoir was built or when it filled up. Um, they also received, um, the settlement also outlined the, um, the right to the flow of the Little Bighorn and Prior River basins, um, but not the um, Bighorn River. So this, uh, the water settlement also included um, these various projects, so things like improving um, irrigation systems that had been built way back um, 100, 100 years ago now, um, in the um, 1910s, the early 1900s, and also for the construction of a drinking water system. So this will serve um, municipal, rural, and industrial users and then the, um, the operation and maintenance of these systems. Um, and to date, this settlement is, it's considered the largest um, tribal settlement, um, just based on the, um, the monetary value. And I mean, there's still, there's, there still are um, several tribes that have settlements outstanding, so this um, is a precedent for for future water settlements. And it also included things um, like the exclusive right to develop a um, hydropower plant um, just, just uh, beneath the Bighorn, just beneath the Bighorn Reservoir. Um, and another key thing is that it includes the legislation um, to allow for a water code, which a lot of tribes, um, a lot of tribes do not have water codes um, based on based on a directive from the Secretary of Interior, um, where there is a moratorium placed on these on these water codes, um, primarily because there's usually conflicts between federal entities and state entities. So um, the Secretary of Interior had. Um, had placed that moratorium in the 70s. And, um, in my own research, I've, I've looked at water codes um, a lot uh, and why, they're, why some tribes have developed them, why some tribes haven't been able to develop them. And I mean, definitely having that moratorium um, is a big obstacle in, in being able to, um, to manage water resources. So um, I'm guessing most people are <laughs> familiar with Montana climate. Um, in this area, it's, it's considered arid, um, less than 15 inches of precipitation. So I always have to um, point that out to people that are probably not familiar. Um, <coughs> so right now, the, um, the water settlement is being managed by the, um, by the Crow tribe and the Crow Tribe Water Resources Department. And I worked um, in this department um, before I started my PhD program um, four years ago now. And I was one of the few engineers that was working with the tribe. Um, I was the only engineer working on behalf of the tribe. Um, a lot of the other a lot of the other engineers were from the federal government um, or contracted out. Um, so at that time, we were, we were looking at um, mainly the planning phase of planning um, what, we wanted, what direction we wanted to go with um, the irrigation project. That was um, f first and foremost. Um, and then I think the tribe now is working on um, the drinking water system as well as the irrigation system. But these are, I mean, these are huge projects. And 
I mean, it's, it's more than, it's more work than a single department can do. So they have, they have to have a lot of, um, of commercial firms come in and actually build and develop these projects. So um, Bartlett and West does a lot of the, um, a lot of the related water projects um, throughout the West, throughout North Dakota, South Dakota. Um, and at the time we were working with um, HKM in Billings. Um, so this is what the planning looks like for irrigation units. Um, I'm not sure that there's been much progress on these, but it's, um, it would just be completely um, ripping out all of the old irrigation units and replacing them. So that will be, a, that will be an ongoing project. And as I had mentioned before, this is the after bay um, directly, directly below the, um, the Yellowtail Dam, um, the Bighorn River. So the tribe will build a, um, it's a really, it's a smaller um, hydropower plant, probably about less than 10 megawatts. Uh, but the tribe can market that power um, or use it however they want. So some of the work that, that I've been doing um, in my graduate work is looking at um, land use. Um, with tribes in particular, um, there's often, there's often um, critical land use um, challenges, I'll say that. <laughs> um, and this is a graphic of the Fort Berthold Reservation, where the three affiliated tribes are located. And it's comparing um, the surface rights, so where people would have ownership of surface lands, to um, their subsurface, the mineral rights. And you can kind of, you can see here where, so this is a huge lake. This is um, the Missouri River is flowing through. Um, this used to be dry land and the Missouri River was flowing through that, so that's why there's all these, um, these mineral tracks that were, that were um, original allotments. Um, so this is another community that was affected by the, um, by the Pig Sloan plan. So a, a challenge that I see um, throughout my own work is, is a lot of um, fractionation of land. So if someone had um, an allotment back in the early 1900s of 160 acres, um, that gets divided throughout um, their heirs, throughout each generation. Um, and I think this is pretty conservative, assuming that there's three three errors per um, per person, and then you multiply that down um, each generation, and you'll have a hundred or over two hundred people um, owning this single piece of land, um, and that has um, that has um, I mean it poses a lot of challenges having that many owners for one track of land because. There's essentially um, no one that has the authority that um, has any say of what happens to that piece of land. Um, and I would, I would say the majority of um, lands, um, tribal lands, have this problem. Um, and that's what I run into a lot um, in, my, in my own work. Um, so I, I just included that graphic, and these are some tables. They're not, <laughs> they're not the best tables, but this was as of um, 1992. So it breaks down the amount of owners um, and the numbers of owners for particular um, for a particular um, track. So you can see um, you can see here that there are over 100 owners for these many these many tracts of land. Um, so I was looking at Fort Berthold and you have, 
um, 33 tracks that have over 100 owners, um, 170 tracks that have 50 to 100 owners. Um, and, and why that stood out to me is I was looking at Fort Berthold and there's a lot of um, oil development there and a lot of leasing of tracks and with that many owners um, there's essentially there's essentially um, let me go back to this one so if you have a hundred owners for 40 acres of land um, you don't have someone saying I want to do this with the land I don't want to do this with the land um, so that's what I found in in my research um, and then I mean you could even extend that to water resource management um, you know what's the what's the overall consequence of having so much acreage with um, essentially no one no one having the authority um, over it so what happens is um, the tribe the tribe eventually um, assumes authority over these lands where you can't get um, consent from all of the owners and the tribes and the um, the BIA decides they're they're the signatory authority of these leases um, so that's what that really stood out to me it wasn't something that I went into looking at um, so there's those issues um, I mean things like the um, the Cobell settlement are trying to trying to look at venues for consolidating these interests for um, allowing people to choose to sell their interests um, and other things like probate reform will um, will allow people that have less than five percent of interest to convey that to only one person instead of continuing to fractionate those interests further. Um, so these are some of the some of the things that I looked at when um, I was doing my master's work on um, impacts at Fort Berthold. So. I was interested in the, um, high, the high usage of water, um, where that came from, um, and what that meant for, for the water resource management. So a challenge that um, that, that community has in Fort Berthold, as well as um, you know, the Crow tribe and I would say the majority of tribes is that they don't have a water code in place um, because of the because of the moratorium on tribal water codes and because a lot of tribes still don't have their water rights quantified um, so those are two key things you need to have your rights to your water how much you're using how much you're managing and then also the authority to manage it um, and if, if the tribes were able to, to put in place their water code, then they could, they could have things like water permitting, um, they could keep track of the water users, they could um, you know, say you're allowed to use, I mean, just like any other system that's in place now, it would be, um, it would be primarily under tribal authority. And also with that, um, with that institution, they could have more. Um, they could have more resources for um, financing and for to enforce um, to enforce these permits, um, because a lot of a lot of the other challenges um, associated with this is just the tribe not having the capacity, not having the technical people, um, not having the resources to go out and. Um, enforce these permits. Um, so I, um, I was working as a consultant for um, the three affiliated tribes, and we saw a lot of problems with, um, you know, just there not being any enforcement for um, all of these environmental programs that they had in place. Um, you know, there, 
they're not very effective when you don't have anyone to actually go out there um, and enforce those enforce those um, permits, um, you know, to make sure that everything is being followed. Um, and I would say that's generally the case for um, for most most tribal communities. Um, and there's other <coughs> there's other complications with um, with having a water code. Um, so certain tribes are considered IRA, which means they accepted the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, and other tribes did not accept the IRA. So the tribes that accepted the IRA, um, they had a standardized government, and they are required to have this approval from the federal government they're required to have the Secretary of Interior's approval on any codes that they develop. And the non-IRA tribes, um, they don't necessarily have to have that approval. Uh, so like the, um, the Navajo Nation is a non-IRA tribe. And I believe they have, a, um, they have a water code. And I'm not sure where their water rights are, or if they're still outstanding. I know they cover um, several states, but um, I mean, so there are there are ways to get around um, get around having the water code, but um, I mean, it's it's definitely a huge barrier, and um, it's particularly interesting to me, you know, when tribes have all of these other these other challenges, these other um, inadequacies. Um, that that's one extra barrier. Um, that they need to they need to go through. So um, the um, three affiliated tribes don't have their don't have their water rights set, um, although they have all of this water. Um, they um, don't have a water code, and the Crow tribe um, has a water code now um, because it was part of the um, part of the legislation in the. Um, water rights settlement. So that was exclusively outlined and the tribe has to develop that code. Um, so in my work um, at Fort Berthold, it, it would have been a lot easier to have a set water code, especially um, for groundwater permitting. Um, what we ran into there into in that case was a lot of people, um, tribal owners, they wanted to um, withdraw groundwater from their own pieces of land, and they weren't able to do that because they can only they can only withdraw um, an amount that would sustain um, you know, their irrigable acreage or for their domestic use, and it's not intended for industrial use. I mean, for taking out, um, you know millions of gallons that were required for, um, for fracking and, um, you know, for all of these acre feet that um, are being taken out from other, from other water users in the area and from groundwater. Um, so that was a huge source of contention um, within the tribe itself is, um, you know, landowners not understanding why they couldn't do that, but um, you know other fee landowners. So often, um, non-Indian water users with permits from the state of North Dakota, they were able to to draw out um, that water, and this water is being marketed to um, to oil companies that um, would use it to frack. So that was. That was um, a situation where, um, you know, where a water code could help define the water management, the water usage, and um, I mean, it it would help define, um, you know, individual tribal members' rights to to their own water. Um, so some of the some of the legality behind it is the Montana test. Um, you'll pretty much see this in. Um, all tribal water law. Um, so it's things like if the um, if the user is 
primarily for um, non-Indian water users. If they're entered into a contract um, with the tribe, then they fall under this test, and they have to um, they have to um, they have to agree to tribal authority, um, or if their activity in some way compromises the um, integrity, welfare of the tribe, then they're under the um, then they're under the authority of the tribe. Um, and this is an important um, component of the um, reasoning behind treatment in a state where tribes are, tribes have the same authority levels as states where they can set their own water quality standards. Um, and that's for all users within, within tribal waters. Um, and even users um, upstate of tribal waters. So um, I, I had mentioned the, um, the various entities that, um, that uh, affect the policy um, regulating water quality. So the big one is the Clean Water Act. Um, and that pretty much gives the, um, the tribes authority to regulate their water quality. Um, and that's tied to the EPA. Um, the EPA grants the tribes treatment as state, so essentially um, sovereigns who have the authority to set their water quality standards. And um, I included the state in there because states pretty much like um, the Western states that have um, prior appropriation water laws um, treat groundwater and surface water um, as different quantities. Um, so, so tribal water codes, um, they, can, they can manage those water resources um, holistically. So groundwater, surface water, um, and permitting, permitting all users, um, they can consider all of those, all of those interactions with the resources. Um, and there are still some, some regulatory holes that can be found in there. So non-Indian water users that can um, follow as wall tent claimants. So, so they're within watersheds that aren't entirely within the boundary um, of the reservation. And it's named after um, a, a claimant that didn't feel that they, um, they fell under tribal authority. So it's, um, it's also a watershed basis. Um, I haven't seen too many tribes um, use this um, system, mainly because their, their management um, isn't at that level where it would be broken down by by watershed that there's not that level of enforcement or that you would see um, non-Indian water users uh, being concerned about the, the tribe's regulatory authority. Um, but theoretically, it's there. Um, uh, so my research now, um, as I said, I'm I'm interested in um, water quality impacts from natural resource development, um, primarily with surface waters and and I think that um, these are all very like unique, complex cases within tribes um, just considering you know, the complexity of their water management system and the complexity associated with establishing water quality standards. And I mean, I, I just see it as, um, you know, an added layer of complexity. So who, um, who has the enforcement capacity? I mean, ultimately it should be the tribe, um, but what is the state of their management system? Um, so these are things that I'm interested in looking at, and I included um, this, this coal, um, <laughs> coal
whole development picture um, because the Crow Tribe um, has this concession with um, with Cloud Peak to develop this um, this resource. So that's going to be um, you know, a huge impact to water resources in the area. Um, and this is a picture that <laughs> I took a couple of days ago. Um, so the Big Meadow Mine is the proposed mine site and it's within these um, foothills, um, you know, pretty, pretty varied elevation. So it's not like a nice flat area that's going to be developed. Um, you know, so I'm interested in looking at um, what the hydrological impacts would be to, um, to an environment like this. And you can also see the make out the herd of deer that are on the hillside there. There was a lot of wildlife in that area. Um, so other things that I think I would eventually like to um, look at are um, more in the water energy nexus. So the trade-off between um, energy development and water use. Um, hopefully in the next phase of my career, that's something that I would be interested in looking at. Um, and also the, um, the gendered impacts of resource development, um, particularly within indigenous communities, there's differing um, impacts to, to indigenous women um, or to, um, to women in these areas where natural resources um, are being developed. So that's my last slide. We have time for some questions. Please, when you say water codes, are, are you talking about just a system to administer water rights within the reservation, like identifying priorities of use or? <coughs> Right, um, yeah, so water codes, um, they're developed by the tribes themselves and the tribe establishes priorities. So um, they're able to establish, um, so if there's drought, they can, they can put that as a priority. Um, so any priority where the um, water users can, where their allocations can be recalled, um, so that's, that can be included. Um, other things like recreational use, um, domestic use, cultural use. Um, and every tribe uh, establishes their, their own priorities for these codes. So you said that, um, that some tribes have the authority to set water standards. Is that refer to water quality standards too, or allocation standards only? And if it refers to water quality standards too, are they limited in any way by the EPA standards? I mean, like, let's say the tribe can set any water standards it, water standards it wants, as long as they're not looser than the EPA standards, or maybe they're totally free to set. <coughs> I'm, I'm very curious, so, so when it's setting standards, what does that refer to? And within uh, you know, how uh, limited or unlimited is the right to set the standards? Uh, so the EPA has to, they would approve any water quality standards that the tribe is going to implement. Um, and they have to be at least at the Most state level um, or as, as the EPA um, determines, but usually they're more, um, they're more restrictive. So they're actually, um, they're actually more, um, they're better water quality standards when, when a tribe does elect to do that. Um, so the water quality is just, so it's regulated under the Clean Water Act, which is completely separate from the state, from the particular um, source of water. Um, so that applies regardless. And then the, um, the quantification is, um, is unique to every tribe. So it's whatever agreements they have with the state um, and the federal government. So that's more tied to 
their water compacts. So, so that's a beginning of your presentation. You said that eminent domain was used in the, in the destruction of this Yellowtail Reservoir. But that's all on tribal land, right? Uh, how were they able to determine eminent domain and getting those rights to secure that massive structure and that development? I, I know that, that the Yellowtail, the Superintendent was against it and all that, but how, how did that work? Yeah, um, so I think that this, so this site had been, um, had been surveyed way back um, before the Pick Sloan plan, so in the early 1900s, so like 19, 1903, like pre, like very early as a potential site for um, for development. I mean, before before the flood control acts, um, which allowed for the building of the dam. And so, so that led to. Um, the land not being um, included in the allotments. So the Secretary of Interior actually um, reserved this canyon from being allotted so that uh, people wouldn't, um, you know, establish their homesteads there. I mean, I guess it was pre, um, you know, things like what, <laughs> I mean, before there were national parks, you know, that was kind of like the, what the Secretary of Interior, um, so those were some of the tactics that were used to, um, but the, the tribe did own, did own this land, it just wasn't allotted land. Um, so that was, in my understanding, that's how that had been um, set up that way. And then they, um, I'm not too sure of the exact history, but it was taken by eminent domain um, from the tribe. The tribe didn't want to to sell it. They didn't want um, you know t the land to be flooded because um, it's um, you know I, I would say the majority. I mean, all the tribes who had dams built on their lands, they didn't want their lands flooded. I mean, that's just. Um, you know, against their against their cultural values, against their um, land use values. Um, but it was, I mean, it was built um, based on legislation. I think it was at a senatorial level, and um, the senator at the time very much um, pushed legislation for for this to happen. So um, the tribe eventually had to take payment for for the site. And just to quickly go back to your return of the state question, Bev, and it's not an easy process either to go through. Um, as an example, Northern Cheyenne applied for treatment as a state in 2002. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the application, EPA took four years to approve it. So in August of 2006, they finally got TAS approval. And then from there, they proposed standards, um, particularly around COVID methane development development, which was huge in the early 2000s. Um, and again, EPA and the state were sort of contesting the tribe standards because they were, um, at least for the sodium absorption ratio standard, it was more stringent than the state's. And the state would have to meet that at our boundary in the Tongue River. Um, and we would also have to meet that standard at the outlet at our northern boundary. Um, they sat on the SAR. <laughs> and DC standards for a long time. The rest of our standards got approved in 2013, and just last December, um, the SAR and DC standards were approved. So the tribe had been working on TAS and standards for 14 years. So it can be a long process. But my other question is, um, how do you know how tribes got around the moratorium on water codes? Because I know a handful of tribes that do have water codes, and Northern Cheyenne is one of them, and it's, the water code isn't necessarily perfect. It allows a general permitting system. We don't have a ton of irrigators. There's, um, majority of the land is owned by the tribe or by tribal members that were allottees. So we don't have a huge fractionated interest 
with like non-members even or fractionated checkerboarded mm -hmm. lands with non-members. Um, so how how did some tribes manage to get a water code? Do you know when? Do you know the date when they established their code? With the tribe, it was two thousand one. So the, the moratorium was placed in the 70s, um, 80s. So any tribe that had established them before, they were, um, they were exempt from this, from this ruling, um, or if they're a non-IRA non tribe. Um, but I mean, I've, I'm not um, a legal scholar myself, but um, I do read a lot of, a lot of legal um, publications about water codes and the general consensus is that a tribe can develop it and operate, you know, practice, um, implement, the, implement the code based on their priorities. They can do that. Um, it's just, it's not going to be approved officially by um, the Secretary of Interior. It's probably not going to be recognized or approved by um, the state, but, um, it's, it's a way that the tribe can establish that, you know, that they have a management system in place. Um, and that can set the groundwork for, um, you know, like, think, like the three affiliated tribes. Um, if they do eventually bring um, a water settlement, um, you know, they would have that already in place and that would make their um, make the case stronger that they are they are capable of managing those water resources um, That's so interesting because well i'll have to double check but i know that our at least at the regional level for bia um they did approve northern cheyenne's water code <coughs> unless unless they got congressional approval um that's another way if the secretary but I mean, it's essentially like the federal government is still yeah. approving it, um, or through water settlements. Mm -hmm. If the if a tribe has a water <laughs> rights settlement, they generally um, have the approval to establish a water code. And then one last question: Is um, the Crow tribe also pursuing, or have they pursued a TAS? Um, not to my knowledge, but. Um, that usually takes um, a lot of, I mean, that takes a lot of um, environmental, technical capacity. So I'm, I'm not sure, but they would have to have um, the capacity to enforce enforce the standards. So Yellowtail Dam is presumably named after Mr. Yellowtail who objected to it? Or it's named right. after something different? Oh no, it's named after him. And it was named before he died? Right? Yeah. Because he didn't die until 1988 or... Right, the, the 80s. The old guy. So, yeah. so, so how did that work? I mean, how can you name something after somebody who says, like, no way? I mean, I'm, I've wondered that myself, um, and he's actually my great-great-grandfather, so I'm a direct descendant, and um, I mean, I've read that it was to, to insinuate that he in some way um, had ulterior motives for not, um, for not allowing the federal government to to build the dam that maybe he had some other plans for it. Um, and I mean, ultimately what, what it did was um, it, it divided the tribe because there were people that said, you know, um, we don't want it. I mean, obviously, and then people who, um, you know, wanted to take the payment because it was going to be built anyway. So. I mean, there were there were also. Um, I mean, that was the environment. Like it was it was such a huge um, it was such a huge controversy um, at the time. So, I think in doing that, that definitely added to um, 
to the um, to the controversy of the time. Um, I'm I'm not sure what he thought about it. Um, Did you ever get to speak with him? So I remember he was he was really old when I was young. Um, I think I remember he had he was his his right. Um, so I was probably about like eight years old when, or I I mean I remember like being five and my dad would take me to his house and. Um, yeah, I mean, he was still he was still very active. He was very um, very interested in how the coal development would go because that really didn't take off until like the seventies and eighties. Um, so he he does have some papers um, around all of the all of the issues he advocated for. Um, so I'm definitely going to try to look at those. Um, but I think that um, you know he was very well known to all the political figures within Montana um, and within the federal government who uh, made Indian policy. So, I mean, he was kind of um, a big target at the time, especially um, being so opposed to the, to the development. Well, I can't imagine somebody say, I'm gonna name this after you, and I say, like, I don't want it, you can't name it after me. You would think somebody would at least have But, but why not? I mean, what's really to prevent naming it? Well, I mean, like you, can you name know, it whatever you want, right? the the lake that's um, that flooded out the communities in um, Fort Berthold that's named after um, a very important historical figure he to was the dead tribes. Alive when that was named. Right. Okay. I mean, it's one thing to name somebody after a deceased person from history without. The I mean, folks right. Associated with that tribe, even wanting that to happen, but it's another thing to name it after somebody who's living and lives for another twenty-five to thirty years. Yeah, I mean, but I think it's along the same lines. Um, you know, I'm sure she wouldn't have been happy about having this lake named after her. Um, I mean, but it's. <coughs> It's just, um, I mean, you know, it was condemned. It it's just falls in line with um, the Indian policy that led up to it. So I'm not surprised that that ended up happening. I actually just see it as a dirty government trick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I did ask my grandmother, like, why? that was and you know what he thought about it um, and I think that in the end he didn't really care much you know he kind of said I put up a fight um, if you're gonna do that yeah. so be it more questions <clears throat> so thank you